Okay, let me set this up because we're going to be looking into the book of Romans. Is this, is this the cable I use? Uh, no? Or is this the one? This is the one. Do you have an HDMI on this thing? Yeah. Oh, okay. We checked that last night. Man, there's a lot of traffic outside here, isn't there? Sorry, let me get. Tuesday morning is when they mow the lawn across the street, so that's usually the. Oh, I see. So in the, what, Hong Kong, Kong? I don't know last week. That was hydraulics. I don't know what was going on, but right when it says something like. There's, there's, they were dumping water. Okay. Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll compete with it. Uh, I've got a microphone on, which I think is for recording. Is this on? But uh, yeah. for those who might be listening, that's the background music. It's the lawnmower <coughs> across the road. Okay, we're going to look into the book of Romans uh, this week. I have nine sessions, three today, three tomorrow, three Thursday. And uh, we're going to be around Friday, but Rick asked me to do these three days. And nine sessions isn't many for what is uh, Paul's longest letter, 16 chapters. But I'm going to pick out what I think are some of the most important parts. And I think it would be fair to say, if we can say this about any part of Scripture, apart from the Gospels, Romans is probably the most important letter in the New Testament. And I have a reason for saying that. Certainly, historically, it's had one of the biggest influences in the history of the church. If you go back in history, you heard of Augustine. Augustine was probably the most important writer after the New Testament was finished in the third century. And Augustine uh, lived a very wayward, promiscuous life. And uh, he was sitting at home in Hippo in North Africa. And he heard somebody over the fence shout, pick up and read. This is his story. He tells it in his book, Confessions. And uh, he thought, well, yeah, I, I, I'll pick something up and read it. And his mother had a hand copied copy of Romans. And he read it. And he was converted. He became probably the biggest influence since Paul. The Reformation in Europe was started when Martin Luther, who was a Catholic priest, was teaching the Book of Romans at the University of Wittenberg. And he came to that in the Gospel, a righteousness from God, righteousness that is by faith. And that transformed his life, changed his teaching, brought about the Reformation, and the whole Protestant Reformation came from discovering the truth that is central to the book of Romans. The evangelical movement began with John Wesley, who was uh, a British uh, preacher. He'd been a missionary in Georgia, in the United States, back in the uh, 1800s, and uh, not converted, went back to England, disillusioned, disappointed, threw in the towel, because he was trying to serve a God he didn't know, and he went to a, a building in Aldersgate Street in London and heard somebody reading Luther's introduction to Romans, and he was converted. And uh, the whole movement that we know as evangelical movement uh, had its, thank you very much, had its roots uh, in that. So there have been big changes in history that have taken place through the book of Hebrews. I don't, can't tell you similar stories about the book of Corinthians or the book of Philippians or the book of Ephesians. I'm sure lots of folks, we've all been influenced by them, but uh, this has been a life-changing, uh, 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 if you like, a point of a, a hinge on which history has turned to understanding the book of uh, Romans. So uh, what I'm going to do is introduce this book this morning. By the way, I've got some... Uh, these 
pass out. Uh, there should be enough for everybody. It's two pages. Um, one, the first page, just so I won't need to spend a lot of time talking about this, it just gives an uh, introduction to the book, who wrote it, when was it written, why was it written, and uh, you can see that. Then there's an outline on the second page, which uh, gives an outline of the whole book. Oh, well, I'll come to that in just a, just a In fact, why don't I, why don't I come to that here? Uh, th this, by the way, is the, the title that I've given the subtitle to this book. It may not make a lot of sense to you right now, but it will make sense, I think, by the end. Restoring the Righteousness of God to Human Experience by Restoring the Life of God to Human Existence. I'll define what righteousness is next session. We'll talk about that because it's one of those words that sounds a bit highfalutin and a bit detached and distant. But basically, it's, it, it's, it's the character of God. Uh, but we'll see that a little bit later. And um, he does it by restoring the life of God in the human experience. The problem that you and I have is not that we're, that we're sinners. The problem is that we're dead. Sin is a consequence of that. In other words, and I'll make this clear later on, Without the life of God within us, we do not have the capability of behaving in the way we were designed to behave, so we sin. But that's not the problem. That's only the symptom. That's the fruit. The problem is that we're separated from God and, and the gospel is placing the life of God back into the soul of man. Those of you there on Sunday morning uh, in the church here, I know some of you are away, but I use that illustration of the glove. The glove without the hand is useless, but put the hand into the glove and all the power of the hand becomes the power of the glove. And it's the life of Christ in us who is life. He is our life and imparts that life to us. And through that, the, the, um, the ability to live as we're designed to live. And uh, we'll be seeing more about that in due course. The Book of Romans has a unique place in that when Paul wrote his other letters, he's writing to people he knew in churches he knew. The only question, apart from Romans, is Colossians, but he had been very involved in, uh, in, in the beginning of the church in Colossae. But because he's writing to churches he knows or to individuals he knows, he's answering their questions, he's correcting their errors, he's sort of resolving problems, he's giving instructions, he's reprimanding individuals. And these are his reasons for writing. But when he wrote to the church in Rome, he'd never been to Rome. And in fact, what he was intending to do was to go to Spain He'd done three missionary journeys. He intended to go to Spain. He said, and I see on the way to Spain, I can call in at Rome. It's the capital of the Roman Empire, so it's a very important city. And I'm going to come in and see you. Somebody else has founded the church in Rome. We don't know who. And uh, when I come, I'm not going to stay long, because he, uh, he, he says in the Book of Romans, I don't build on somebody else's foundation. This is somebody else's work. But what I'm going to do is come visit you, and I'm going to tell you what I'm going to, sh what I'm going to talk to you about when I'm there. I'm going to share with you what is, what is the gospel. Um, and so he explains that. Let me just, so I put a couple of maps on here, which we won't look at, but that was Paul's journey. It's all in this part of the eastern Mediterranean, uh, and you've got these maps in the back of your Bible. I don't know if you're looking at the book of Acts. Have you, have you studied Acts? Are you going to be studying Acts at some stage? I'm not sure. But um, if you are, you'll become a little more familiar with that. And so when he wrote this letter, he's back over here in, um, well, he's on his way back from his third missionary journey, which is the green journey coming back here. And on his way back, he writes to them and says, I've just got some business to attend to in Jerusalem, and then I'm going to come and visit you on my way to Spain. Spain, of course, was, uh, was way over here. And so going from uh, Jerusalem down here to Spain, he looked at a map and said, oh, I can come and visit you in Italy on the way. Not to 
start anything new, but just to fellowship with you. And I'm going to tell you, when I, I'm going to tell you in this letter what my message is going to be when I come to you. And so for that reason, it is the most systematic explanation of the gospel we have in the New Testament. And uh, basically, when you read through Romans, there's some things missing that maybe surprise us. He never mentions heaven, for instance. Because his message is that the gospel is not so much about getting people out of hell and into heaven, it's about getting God out of heaven into people. That God by his spirit might live in people, be reconciled to God, living in people, working through people. Heaven is a consequence, but heaven is geography. It's not, a, it's not the goal. It's where we're going to be when we're not here, because this life is temporary. Uh, but it's not the point of the gospel. And um, we're going to see a bit more of that too uh, as, we, as, we, as we go through. So let me give you an outline that is the one I've put here, but I've fleshed it out on the printed page. But this is just the general uh, direction in which we're going. First 15 verses of chapter 1, he introduces himself and his message. We'll talk about that this morning. Uh, and then chapter 1, verse 16, to the end of chapter 8, is what I've called doctrinal, uh, where he explains now what is the nature of the gospel. What is wrong with humanity? That's his first issue. Let's do a diagnosis. Uh, secondly, why did Christ die? Why is that necessary? Uh, how come, as he puts it, God justifies the ungodly? That's contrary to normally what, what people think. If, if, or justifies the wicked. If, if you're wicked, you need to pay the consequences. Why does God justify the wicked? He talks about that. And uh, what does it mean to, to experience him by faith? What is, why are we fighting this battle with an old nature that fights against the spirit and the spirit against the old nature? And then in chapter 8, he talks about the Holy Spirit. Chapter 8 of Romans is, 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 the, is the strongest chapter in the New Testament on the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Christian. That's what that chapter is all around, all about. And then when he gets to chapter 9 to 11, he does a little historical sort of parenthesis where he talks about uh, how the God brought the gospel to the nation of Israel. The purpose was not Israel when God chose them through Abraham. The purpose was the seed of Abraham, which is Christ. So what happens to Israel now? And he talks about uh, how that God chose them. He talks about election of Israel. And that's a big subject, of course. And then how Israel rejected, uh, turned their back on God, and God brought a remnant out of the nation of Israel. And then how Gentiles are grafted in. And he looks at that, uh, the sort of historic sequence there. Um, and then he gets back in chapter 12, almost the follow on. If you took this three chapters out, you wouldn't notice the difference. Uh, it's kind of, by the way, doo -doo 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 -doo. now let's get back to it. But it's important because that's why it's there. But then chapter 12 uh, talks about the practical outworking um, of the indwelling presence of Christ. He talks about spiritual responsibilities, presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice, about spiritual gifts, about living a life of love. He talks about our civil responsibilities in the world at large. This is on the outline that I've given to you um, towards the state, towards our neighbor. Uh, practical living, don't judge one another, don't cause others to stumble, serve one another. This is all in that section there. And then he concludes by um, telling them why he's going to come to Rome. He tells them that at the end of the letter. Then he lists 26 people he knows in Rome, some of whom are his relatives, he says. And he sends greetings to them all, tells a little bit about some of them. And then he finishes praying for the Christians in Rome. So that's, that's the whole outline and and it's really what's contained in this sheet you have here this we're going to look at this this morning Paul's and then we're going to talk about this 
section for the rest of our time because that's really all we, we have time to do and to do well. Because we need to do these things well. We can do them very superficially, skim across the top, and at the end, you know, we haven't got very much. I want to look at uh, things that will be uh, hopefully, hopefully uh, impacting our own lives in a deep and a lasting way. So let's go to the introduction. Um, which in verse, chapter 1, verse 1 to 6, I'm, I'm calling the man and his message. And let me read this to you. And if you've got a Bible there, you can read it with me. I'm using the NIV, the New International Version. I've used it for many years. They revised it about 10 years ago now. And so the one you buy now in the bookshop is a bit different to the one that I have in some places. Uh, but I've got the old one. And... Uh, so it's the, old, it's, the, it's the old New International Version. <laughs> okay, it says this, Romans 1, 1 to 6, I'll read. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his human nature was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through him and for his namesake, we receive grace and apostleship to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Okay, first of all then, what he says about himself, and basically, he introduces himself as a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, and set apart for the gospel of God. We'll look at those three things one by one. First of all then, he is a servant of Jesus Christ. It's one thing to be a follower of Jesus Christ. It's another thing to be a servant. And the word servant, the word that's translated servant in our English Bible, is the word doulos in the Greek. Now, servant is a kind of softer version of what is implied by the Greek word doulos. Because elsewhere, it is translated as slave. Uh, for an example, Romans 6, verse 19, you, Paul uses the same word, where he says, For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity, he uses the word doula, same word there, and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness. Again, the same word, doulos, leading to holiness. I think it's the King James Bible that has Paul saying, Paul, a bond slave. Is that right? I don't know if anybody's got one. Bond servant. What's your New translation? Oh, New King James. Yeah, bond servant. Mine's the King James version. It just says servant. Oh, servant. Okay, that's King James. Okay. Okay. Bond. Maybe it's a revised bond servant. Um, in in other words, I am tied to somebody. That's the connotation of this servitude here. Now we don't like the word slave, of course, because it has awful connotations of um, forced subjugation and harsh treatment and abuse and so on. So we don't like that word. But this word doulos, servant, bond servant, of course, is not forced. It's, it's freely given. And the flip side of Paul being a servant is that Jesus Christ is
therefore I am his servant. When I was uh, a young Christian, I came to Christ when I was 12 years of age. And I struggled for a few years to understand what the Christian life really was about. And I had the idea that there were kind of two kinds of Christian. There was a, a sort of the average Christian, I, I would say, the average Christian was somebody who had Christ as their savior. And the benefits were their sins had been forgiven and they were going to heaven when they died. And that was the reason for knowing Christ as your savior. That was the sort of average version. And then I thought there was a, a super deluxe version as well. And this super deluxe version uh, was when you had Christ as your Lord. And we used to have youth meetings when the preachers would kind of stress that kind of thing and they'd say, is Jesus your Lord? You know, and they would talk like this and they would challenge us to come to a full surrender of our lives to Christ and so on. But I've come to understand that that's not a right way to understand things at all. Paul said in, uh, let me, where's the verse? It's in, um, uh, it's in Romans 14, I think it's verse 10, or verse 9. The Christ died and returned to life that he may be Lord, of both the dead and the living. But actually, the basic Christianity is bringing your life in submission to Christ as Lord. Jesus is spoken of as Savior 24 times in the New Testament. He's spoken of as Lord 600 times. Now, it's wonderfully true that he saves us, of course, but that's only part of what he comes to do. It's a wonderful part. But he comes to take over. He comes to be Lord. He comes to move in. My wife, Hilary, will be coming here tomorrow night. She's a lovely lady. She's a great cook. She came to our home. She'd make you a nice meal. And I said, I want you to meet my cook. What do you think she'd say? <laughs> I'll tell you what she'd say. She'd say, what did you say I was? Who did you say I was? I said, well, you're my cook. You cook for me, don't you? I'm not your cook. I'm your wife. Of course she is. I got married, I didn't say, I take you to my person. I didn't take you to be my lawfully wedded cook. No. And you see, she cooks for me, <laughs> but she's not my cook. I, I can cook as well, by the way. I do a good boiled egg <laughs> once a week. Uh, no. Jesus Christ being our Savior is like my wife being my cook. She does that. He does that. But he comes to be Lord. When I married Hillary, I said, I take you to be a lawfully wedded wife. When she became my wife, there are lots of things came in with the package, so to speak, yeah. including that she cooks. But she's not my cook. I've been insult. And Paul is saying that I'm living in a relationship with Jesus Christ where I'm not volunteering for some kind of Christian ministry. I'll be an apostle. I'll travel the Mediterranean world. I brought my life under the authority of Jesus Christ. He is my Lord. I am his servant. And therefore, everything I do in my life is done because he puts me there and he leads me and it is for his purpose that I am operating. Yeah, here's the verse, by the way, Romans 14, verse 9. For this very reason... Christ died and rose again that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. 14 verse 9, that verse is saying this is why he died and rose, that he might be Lord. Now, I know lots of us uh, get scared about that. Um, we, we feel if I say, Lord, you can tell me what to do, show me what to do, he's probably going to say, What's the last thing in the world you'd like to do? 
Huh? What don't you like? You wouldn't want to be a dentist? No? Okay. Here's my will. Be a dentist. <laughs> yeah, we have that kind of fear, don't we? <laughs> that it was the last thing I wanted, the first thing God wants. I remember once uh, in England, I was talking at a, in a school. They had an after-school Christian meeting at 4 o'clock, whatever it was, at the end of school. And, and I was speaking at a meeting in the school when at the end of it, I'm finished talking, I was sitting down, there was a girl with another girl sitting on a seat over on the side of the room, and she was crying. And uh, I went over, and uh, I, I said, you are right. And her friend said, look what you have done. I said, oh, I'm sorry, what have I done? So you upset my friend. So I sat down on the other side of her, and I said, uh, can I help you at all? And she was kind of sobbing and didn't say anything. So I thought, I, I wonder if she, if God has convicted her and she needs to come to Christ. So I, I said, uh, are you a Christian? And she said, no, no, I'm not. I said, oh, this is good. <laughs> Would you like to become one? She said, no, no, I don't. I said, oh, okay. Yes, I do, but I don't. But, but yeah, no, no. And, and so we talked, and she said, I want to give my life to Christ, but I'm scared he'll spoil it for me. I said, how do you think he's going to spoil it? He'll probably send me off to Africa or something like that, she said, through tears. I said, well, maybe he will. And if he does, it'll be because you want to go to Africa too, because the way God works is this. It says, delight yourself in the Lord. He gives you the desires of your heart. That doesn't mean he gives you what you want, but your desires become God-given. He puts desires into your heart. And if he wants you to go to Africa, the first thing you do is create a desire in your heart for the right thing, which is why the wonderful thing about living under the Lordship of Christ is that you actually do what you want to do. Because he puts that desire within you in terms of the direction of your life. Anyway, we talked for her, and she came to Christ. Cape Mary Hall, which is where I mentioned I met Rick, where I was on staff for many years. Through the summer, we have summer long conferences, uh, camps really, young people. And a whole group from that school came up to this camp. And uh, she came with them. So I got to know her later, got to know her better. She had given her life to Christ. Her family had given her a really hard time because they weren't Christians and they gave her a really hard time for becoming a Christian. But, but here's the best part of the story. She met a guy, she married him, and they went to Africa. <laughs> they really went to Africa. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I met her when they came back on one occasion. And I said, do you remember that conversation we had in the school? And she didn't remember it. I said, you said, you might send me off to Africa. Did I say that? I said, yeah, you said that. I remember it. And well, he went to Africa. And... Uh, the reason is because, and this is what's so great about giving your life over to Christ, that he works in you in such a way that he puts the right desires into our hearts. It's a key verse to me in my own guidance, is Psalm 37, verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. There's a wrong way to read that, and there's a right way to read that. The wrong way is, delight yourself in the Lord, and you can have whatever you want. <laughs> That's the wrong way to read it. You can have your own desires. The right way is to let yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires. He'll put those desires into your heart. He'll give you a sense of, uh, uh, of desire for something. And um, again, I remember talking to a student in, uh, in Cape Moray in England, you know, sitting like you're sitting here now. And I said to him one day, what are you going to do with your life? He said, I'm not sure yet. I said, do you have any desires? He said, yeah, I'd like to be a pilot. He was from Chicago. His dad flew... 747s for United Airlines back in those days. Uh, and he said, I want to be a pilot. I said, well, why don't you be a pilot? He said, because it's my will, not God's. I said, why do you say that? He said, because I've always wanted to be a pilot. I said, I said but there's a verse, I showed him this, delight yourself in the Lord, he gives you the desires of your heart. If this desire is strong within your heart, maybe God put it there. He said, no, no, because I had this before I became a Christian. This isn't from God, this was just me being selfish. I said, but God was your creator before he was your savior. And when he created you, he wired you in certain ways. 
and so maybe this desire also from when you were young before you knew Christ was one that God had put within you because God said to Jeremiah in the beginning Jeremiah and Jeremiah said I can't speak you know I, I don't know how to, to, to be a prophet and, and God said who, who made your mouth who created you Jeremiah I knew you before you were even born, he said. I knew you in your mother's womb. And in your mother's womb, I began to prepare you and make you what you were supposed to be. And that story has a happy ending too, because he did become a pilot. I mean, sometimes we've got to really struggle because God leads us in areas that are going to be tough and strong. I know about that as well. You say, there's a basic underlining sense. This is what God is coming to do. But this particular part of that process is going to be tough. I don't want it really. But you allow him to lead you in it and through it. And he brings about uh, good things. Paul's own work as a servant of Christ was full of suffering and anxiety. And, uh, you know, he gave a whole list one day to the Corinthians about... Um, his credentials for being an apostle when, when some people were challenging them and said he wasn't a real apostle because so many things went wrong with him. Uh, and, and he said in 2 Corinthians 11, 2 11 and verse uh, uh, 23, I'll read it to you. He says, are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this, but I am more. I've worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Man, that alone is bad enough. In prison, flogged, exposed to death. Five times I received from Jews the 40 lashes minus one. That's 39 lashes with, with, with cords, leather cords that have bits of bone tied into them, but every time the... The leather lacerated the back of the person. It would break into the flesh and bring out chunks of flesh. Three times I was beaten with rods. That's just rods beating him. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. And he goes on for another six verses giving lists of all the bad things that had happened to him and all the hard things that had happened to him. So being a servant of Jesus Christ doesn't mean, oh, well, God puts the desire into my heart. It's going to be all a hunky-dory. No, it's going to be tough. There can be as many tears as there will be joy in serving God. But, Paul says, my life is lived under the authority of somebody else. And that is where he found his fulfillment and his meaning and his purpose. And that has to be true for you and for me as well, of course. It's the starting point. He's a servant of Jesus Christ. The second thing then he says, he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. Then was when Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle. That's what God has set me apart for. So if one is a very lowly description, I'm a servant, that's a very lowly sounding description of Jesus Christ. This is a very lofty description. I'm called to be an apostle. The word apostle means sent one. And if I, if I were to say to, to, to one of you, oh, would you run and get something for me, and you run off and get it, it would be legitimate to use the word of that, you're being my apostle in doing that. Uh, that word is used in the New Testament. It'll take too long to show you and give you all the context for it where Paul said as somebody is his apostle because he's running off to get something. The word is used in the, in, in, in the Greek text, the, the same word. It means to be sent. So I'm a servant of Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean sitting back doing nothing. It means being sent. In this case, in this case, uh, being sent as in the unique sense in which the apostles of the early church were and somebody speaking authoritatively on behalf of Jesus Christ. When they came to deciding which of the text of scripture or which, which of the Various books that circulated our scripture that can be included in the canon, the Bible, and it took several hundred years. 
until the Bible as we know it was completed, one of the big criteria of the New Testament is what was their relationship to the apostles? Luke wasn't an apostle, but he traveled with Paul. He did his homework well. He was a doctor, and he says at the beginning, and I've researched all these things very carefully, uh, Mark wasn't an apostle, but he was, worked alongside Paul as well. Uh, because an apostle was somebody who had authority and to whom God revealed particular things that needed to be known. Because, of course, in the first century, first generation church, they didn't have the New Testament to preach from like we have. Uh, so how, 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 how is this going to be put together? And uh, God set apart certain people. And uh, Paul was one of them who was coming to speak authoritatively. The point I want to make, though, at, at this point, is that, um, well, I think I put it down here somewhere. Uh, sorry, I should have moved that down before. The sermon is a low description. Apostle is a lofty description. Here's the point. Paul had a divine call from heaven to be something on earth. That's the important thing. He's saying, I am what I am. I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm being what I've been called to be. Not because I wanted a job in Christianity, but because I've had a divine call from heaven to be something on earth. And of course, so can you. And so can I. We're not apostles. The church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. That's the foundational ministry role. But God equally calls people to be a teacher, to be a taxi driver, to be a farmer, to be an accountant, to be a politician, to be a builder, to be a mother. be the father of a family. These are all divine missions and we need to see them as such. And ask in every situation, what is God's agenda here? What does God want to accomplish here? And uh, somebody said this in the, in the worship time we had earlier. Who was, it, who was it leading it? Anyway, he said something about, you know, God has a, God has a purpose for us today or something. But whatever language you used, I thought that's, that's the point I'm going to make here. You can wake up to every day, God, I may not like the weather, may not like the environment, may not like what's going on, I'm not very well today, there might be all kinds of things I'm not enjoying today, I've fallen out with somebody, but I have a divine calling from heaven to be something on earth today. Always, of course, being precedes what we do to be something. And we'll see in due course how Paul elaborates on, on that, what, what it is that we're, we're going to be. Um, this is about what Paul says about himself. So the third thing he says, he is set apart for the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ. He's a servant. He's a part an apostle, and he's been set apart, uh, as he says here, for the gospel of God. If the first is a lowly description, I'm a servant, a lowly description, and the second is a lofty description, I'm called to be an apostle. His third one is a lengthy description, I'm set apart for the gospel of God. Paul did say elsewhere in Galatians, I don't think I have it on my screen, no I don't. But he did say elsewhere in, 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 in um, Galatians 1.15, he speaks of himself as when God set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, was please reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. So even Paul's skills at mobilizing people against the church before he was converted as the arch enemy of the church 
were really gifts given him by God from his conception that would equip him to uh, be set apart for the gospel. And um, in order for him to be, of course, the apostle to the Gentiles was his primary calling in due course. And I'm running quite fast through this, but I, uh, I hope it's not too fast to not pick up the main thrust of it. Uh, and then um, he talks about his message, what Paul says about himself first. I'm a servant, I'm an apostle, I'm set apart. What he says about his message. Uh, is in verse, well, let, let me read you uh, the whole thing in verse 2. Uh, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scripture regarding his son, who was to his human nature, the descendant of David, and who through the spirit of hol holiness was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Just a couple of things to point out from, from this. Its source, he says, gospel promise through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The gospel didn't begin with Jesus Christ. It has its roots in history long before he was ever born of course. He was not the founder of Christianity, but the fulfiller of the promise God had made initially in the Garden of Eden to Eve when he said that the seed of Eve would crush the head of the serpent. That would kill him, destroy him. Meaning of that promise made to Abraham when he set him apart and from your body will come the seed which Paul says in Galatians was a singular it's Christ is coming so the roots go way back in, into history and it's important that, that we understand this that, that what we have through the prophets and the Old Testament scripture is as important and gives authentication you might say to what we find in the New Testament. Because you can preach all the important things about the life of Jesus from the Old Testament as well as from the New Testament because they're all prophesied and talked about in advance. I quoted a statistic that I had heard on one occasion that there are 333 prophecies in the Old Testament about Christ. I haven't counted them, but that's what somebody else has said. And this person said that the chances of those 333 prophecies being fulfilled in one person are one in 83 billion. I quoted that. A guy came to me afterwards and said, uh, your figures are way out. I said, why is that? He said, I'm a mathematician. He said, uh, 333 different prophecies all being fulfilled. It's not going to be 183 billion. I'm going to work out how much it is. And he sent me a figure. And it was trillion, 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 trillions, he said. <laughs> and if it was 334 prophecies, it would have been trillion. But the remarkable thing is that all those Old Testament prophecies which were in circulation before Christ was born all came to fruition. He was born in Bethlehem. That was a fluke, actually. Because his mother lived in Nazareth. And it just so happened that Joseph, who she was engaged to be married to, was from a family from Bethlehem. It just so happened Caesar Augustus decided, I want to count how many people live in my empire. We're going to have a census. Go down to the place your family comes from and be counted in the census and it just so happened Mary was pregnant and good man alive, we've got to go down to Bethlehem to get a drag hey? poor lady, so they got down to Bethlehem takes a day, to, I don't know what day the census was but you just go and check your name 
Joseph, Mary, that's it. Go, would have gone back home in two days, maybe stop and meet the grandparents and say hello to everybody, introduce Mary to the relatives. But they should have been back home in a week in, in that kind of situation. It just so happened. They arrived late. Everybody else had come from the census. No room in the inn. We'll put you up in the stable at the back. You can sleep in the manger, which is the feeding trough, because there's no cattle there at the moment. Obviously, otherwise they couldn't have slept in the manger. 800 years before, Micah was sitting down writing, and he said, out of you, Bethlehem, Judea, and he writes about, will come the Messiah. 800 years, that's like going back to what, 20, 19, the 1913 hundreds. And he got it dead on. In fact, if you go to Matthew chapter 2, there's three prophecies there. One is from Hosea, who said, He will, out of Egypt, I'll call my son. Well, that was another book, humanly speaking. It just so happened that some wise men came from the east, but they weren't wise, wise men. They were very unwise, wise men, because they knocked on, Pharaoh's, uh, on Herod's door and said, where's this new king going to be born? <laughs> what do you mean, this new king? Well, your days are numbered. You know, there's a new king being born in Bethlehem. All right, go and find him, and then come back and let me know where he is. Well, they had a dream when they got to Jesus, but don't go back and tell Herod. Get out of here as quickly as you can. So they didn't go back and tell Herod. So he decided to kill every baby under two, every baby boy under two. And Joseph had a dream, get out of here fast as well, and head south. And he went down to Egypt. And Hosea had written, out of Egypt, I have called my son. And then they came back to Nazareth. Matthew chapter 2 tells us that uh, it says, as was fulfilled, uh, as fulfilled what the prophet had said, he would be called a Nazarene. It's hard to find that in the Old Testament, but it comes from Isaiah. It's a play on a Hebrew word, Nazarene. And uh, it was written 800 years before. So in, in Matthew chapter 2, he'd be born in Bethlehem. He quotes it. He'll come out of Egypt, and he'd be called a Nazarene. And those three things, the chance of those two things happening when they did is remarkably uh, unique. So my point is this, and I have to finish here because of the time. We have a better reason for believing that Jesus Christ was born, lived, died, and rose from the dead than the Bible said that he did. And the better reason is that the Bible said that he would long before he ever did. That's the better reason. You go on a news site and you can read yesterday's news. Anybody can read yesterday's news. If you go on a news site and you read something's going to happen next year or five years or ten years or a hundred years from now, let's say, let's say even a month from now, and you read a, 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 an article about something's going to happen a month from now, and a month from now it happens, you'd want to meet the editor. Hey, where'd you get that information from? But 330 times, 333 times, according to somebody else who's counted them, 333 times, this will happen, this will happen, this will happen. A detailed description of crucifixion in Isaiah 53 before crucifixion was ever invented by the Phoenicians centuries later. All this information, 233 times, and when Jesus was born in the right place at the right time, he did the right things and everything came to pass. And we have a better reason than simply the Bible says he did historically. The better reason the Bible said he would prophetically. And it all worked out on time. But it's coming up, it's just after quarter two. So I think that's the time I, I need to stop. So we, we, we'll stop there. Um, good. What happens now? Uh, questions asked now. Oh, questions, okay. I thought it was coffee, much more interesting than coffee. Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, if you have any questions. Sure. I don't have any answers, but you might have some questions. Oh, sorry. I was just wondering how long was Paul's third mission to Mary during the year? How long was it? That was a couple, he spent, on that journey, he spent two years in Ephesus alone. His third mission journey. 
Yeah, so that was his main stay on the third journey. So the whole thing was probably close to three years. He doesn't write it as a diary uh, and, and give us detail. We speculate, we work it out. But it was on his way back, and he said, I've finished the work I had to do in this area, the eastern part of the Mediterranean, and so I'm going to go to Spain next. And that's where he come visit on the way. But um, yes, uh, the chronology, working out the sequence of Paul's life, it can be done, but it's a bit, perhaps, maybe, could be. Uh, but he didn't start till 12 years after he'd become a Christian. Uh, but then his first journey was not very long. It didn't go very far, a year or so. But yeah, his third one, two years he was in, in, in Ephesus alone on that, plus other places, yeah. Um, so you talked a little bit in the beginning about Paul claiming himself to be a servant of Christ, right? And I remember in your sermon on Sunday, you talked a lot about like claiming God to be your Lord, or, you know, consecrating yourself in God. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, uh, yourself in God, but, um, that was part of. Uh, how do you think uh, Paul walked out being a servant of Christ? Is that just like a, a set of disciplines, yeah. or is that because of his I mean, dramatic? Well, it's, it began right at the beginning. What do you want me to do? I said, what do you want me to do? And Ananias came to him and explained who this was he'd met. This is, this is Jesus, the one you persecuted. Well, Jesus told him that, but Ananias came, brought him into... I, I don't think he was converted on the Damascus Road because when Ananias came to him, he said, be baptized, wash away your sins. And he laid his hands on him. He received the Holy Spirit. So it sounds like he was under conviction but he had said, what do you want me to do? And uh, he was told what, it, it says, he was told what he must do. He would preach to the Gentiles, he would suffer. And Paul gives his testimony uh, three times, I think it is. And he, he refers to that, that he was told he would take the gospel to the Gentiles and that he would suffer in the course of the gospel. So that's basically what he was told at the beginning. Now how, uh, he waited, and I think this is an important thing, uh, you, you wait for circumstances to, to come together. Paul went back to Tar Well, he went, if we can try and reconstruct Paul's experience, he went to Arabia for three years, where it seems he was on his, on his own, in isolation. And he speaks sometimes that God had revealed this to him and that to him. It seems maybe in those three years, he spent his time with the only scriptures he had, which the Old Testament scriptures, and God showing him that he was a scholar, Old Testament scholar. He had studied under Gamaliel in Jerusalem, who was the most famous of the, of the teachers there. And so it seems that God had revealed himself to him in some ways. He went back to Tarsus, which is in Turkey, where he came from. He got a job. Uh, he became a tent maker. He'd been trained as a Pharisee, but he, now he got a job. But we're not sure what to do. And after a number of years, uh, Barnabas contacted him because he met Barnabas before. And Barnabas was leading the church in Antioch and said, I want you to come and help me in Antioch. And he came down to Antioch, spent two years in Antioch with, Paul, with, with Barnabas. And then it says that uh, the church in Antioch, the Holy Spirit said, set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work which I've called them. And they went off on the first missionary journey and they're called Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul did this, Barnabas and Saul. And then Paul preached a sermon and had a huge impact. And from then it says Paul and Barnabas, Paul, he became the dominant person. Uh, so there's a, there's a sense of, there's a combination of, God has told me I'm going to preach the gospel of Gentiles. I'm going to suffer for it as well. But I'm not going to go looking for suffering. I'm going to wait until the circumstances present themselves. And he never went back to Jerusalem, he said, for 12 years after his conversion. And so we know it was 12 years before he went on his... Because he went from Antioch on his first journey, he went down to Jerusalem there as well with, with Barnabas. So he waited. And, uh, yeah. I mean, w we, we tend to think everything has to happen now. Uh, and sometimes it doesn't. We, we, we wait for God. God told Abraham, you're going to have a son. He was already 75 years of age. No son came for 25 years. So he then sported by 
having a son through the maid Hagar, which was Ishmael, because Isaac, God said, I'm going to give you a son, but uh, in my time, I'm going to test you. And he had to wait. So, you know, Saul wasn't in a hurry. Okay, time for coffee.